Hey everybody, this is Sharma bin Yashua, and this is a testimony of a black Israelite. Before I go and share with you what the Lord has done for me and the process he has led me to to this point, I want to first give all glory, honor, and praise to our King Jesus Christ. I give all glory to him for everything he has done for me in my life, for keeping his hedge of protection around me, for keeping his hand of love upon me and for helping me to see the most difficult times in my life through and preserving my life so I could be here today to give you the testimony. All glory goes to Jesus Christ. And regardless as to what is revealed, may it be understood that we are all one in Jesus Christ. Whether we be Jew or Gentile, it matters not. For the moment that you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we are all grafted in into the olive tree. And we become one people under God, under Jesus Christ. So we stand together in unity and declaring that it doesn't matter where our nationalities, ethnicities, and our background may be coming from. The most important thing is the spiritual state of the body of Christ. The spiritual state of the sons and daughter of daughters of the most high especially in this hour so we are all one we are all now spiritual israel because of the testimony and the confession that we have declared to make jesus christ our lord and savior and so on march 12 2016 the lord led me to a place that can help me find out more about exactly where i came from like you know it has been said that you know african americans we all come from africa etc but the thing is is that in africa you know the continent of africa is made up of many countries it's just not one big country but many different parts so it really started to make me wonder what parts of Africa exactly did I come from? Because you see, I do not come from a typical, you know, African American background. As a matter of fact, my parents are from the Caribbean islands. So the, during the slave trade, etc., the group of slaves that met, made it to the Caribbean islands was not the same group of people that made it to America. As a matter of fact, it was the, it was in the island of Haiti. And so in Haiti, it was pretty much the French who owned that territory at the time. And they imported the African slaves from wherever, you know, they came from, from Africa um, to Haiti in which they settled in and they resided in. So pretty much my lineage is different from that of the African-Americans that was taken straight into America um, during the great slave trade back in the day. And so getting back to this, so on uh, 12th of March, 2016, I made it to this place. Um, I came across this place and I went to go, well, well, first I made the phone call to find out if they actually do support um, hereditary DNA testing. Uh, ancestral DNA testing and he said yes they do and um, I guess they haven't done it in a long time because when I was inquiring about it uh, they seem to have you know needed to bring themselves us back to speed as well as the process in regards to it and so once they explained to me you know how the ancestral origins work and um, how the DNA markers uh, are laid out and how accurate it is and identifying you know specific locations of you know the people group in which I may belong in then I began to have more confidence to you know understand that this is the place that the Lord was leading me to and so it was the case and so I went over there to uh, you know any lab now, any test lab, well, any lab test now, and then um, they uh, began to go through the whole process and trying to find out, you know, DNA matches and stuff like that, in which many people are familiar to. And so uh, from there, I just had to wait and see what the results would be. And so at first, what they told me is that the results can take as long as 10 to 15 days, maybe even longer, depending on um, the amount of, you know, uh, orders that they have may be backed up for a little bit. So I had to wait for a while. And so what ended up happening is that um, on a day in which I went to take the samples, I thought that maybe it would be just like a 10 to 15 day turnaround and I should get the information. Because um, my wife, she she also did it too. And she discovered some stuff about her background, which is very interesting. Um, but hurricanes rather quickly, but mine was taking some time. And so, you know, days started going by, the days became weeks, and the weeks became a full month. And then after a full month, it was like a month and a half, 
And I thought, you know what, maybe there's just some things that's going on and I just need to wait on the Lord until the Lord tells me when it's time for me to go and try to find out what's going on. And so after pretty much putting it in the back, uh, in the back of my mind and not really thinking about it as much, uh, my wife reminded me last weekend that I needed to go ahead and get in contact with them to find out if something happened because I didn't hear back from them for a while. And so I told her, yep, I'll take care of it. Uh, probably on Monday when they're open again, I'll give them a call. And so the day and so that day was on the 25th of April 2016, which is actually today in which I'm making this recording. And also what is interesting is that today is the Feast of First Fruits, you know, the Happy Resurrection Day to everyone, because according to the Hebrew um, biblical calendar, today is a day in which the Lord resurrected from the dead. Um, and so I just want to say happy resurrection day, happy first fruits, praise Jesus because of the fact that he risen from the dead. We now have everlasting life. Uh, all glory be to God. And so getting back to the story is that so when I called them up and I told them, hey, uh, I was just calling to inquire about the status of the results because I haven't heard anything from it uh, from them for, for, uh, for a while. Uh, they thought it was kind of strange because they thought that the results already came in. It was taken care of already. And so they went to go and look at the, you know, their records to find out what's the status of the test results. And when they pulled up the online profile, it said still testing. And they're like, wait a minute, that's kind of weird. Like, why would it take so long to still be, you know, to still go through the testing process? It should have been done weeks ago. And so they did some further digging and it turns out that they've actually gotten the results back. If you look at the uh, screen before you, it says uh, Metapro Direct. Um, if you look down at the bottom, it says Laboratory Director. And it was signed off on the 17th of March, 2016. So for some reason in the database, that information never changed. So it was there since the 17th, but I didn't, it was not yet the time in which the Lord wanted me to go and find out about this because since that time, there's, there's been a lot more things which took place leading up to this, you know, appointed time, this special occasion that I feel is the reason why the Lord wanted me to wait until this day to see this message and to bring forth um, what's in it. And so now to help you understand what you're looking at, it says the genetic profile information, informational test, right? Uh, you know, you go to the, to the DNA lab, they take the different markers, there's 22 markers to help identify, um, you know, our DNA makeup and to help correlate that to the people, you know, to other different people group in which you're clo close to. Um, for example, DNA testing to find out who is the parent of a child and stuff like that is pretty much the same exact process. But the only difference is, is that they're taking that DNA marker and they're comparing that to groups of people around the world. So that lets you know how accurate it is when it comes to identifying people group because the same kind of method you're seeing here is the same method that is being used to find out if a mother if a father is the you know if a male is the father of a child and so that DNA you know accuracy that comes with this process is very awesome and it's outstanding and if you look at the marker it says the analyzed male profile is expected to occur one in so it's saying that uh, it's pretty much saying that in every this many amount of black people in the world, my marker will show up the exact same pattern. And so if you look at that number, it says 3350469884090, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That is more than a number that I don't even think is in existence today. Because the highest that I think that I can go is trillion. And this thing still has four other places that let you know how accurate it is. How there is not a single person in the world that can match this exact DNA makeup. You know, that's how unique our DNA pattern is. Is that when we have that DNA pattern that has been created and ordained by God. Is that he makes you very, very, very unique. So unique that it won't be until another this many people, this many amount of people you see there. And this is only for the black population because I'm African American, right? Well, yeah, I'm African American. Uh, this is, it's like they're saying that after every this many amount of people will that exact same pattern occur. So we are indeed very, very unique to God. And so now when we take this result, when they're taking this result and compare it to a specific people group around the world, it's going to be very, very, very accurate as to the, as to the knowledge of where our people currently reside in around the world. 
All right, and so now part of the package and when they did the uh, DNA screening to find out my ancestral background is that they give you this profile, this ancestral origins uh, profile booklet, which actually shows a breakdown of how migration has occurred over the past, you know, thousands of years. And then what they're going to do is that they're going to take my DNA makeup and insert it to where the people which closely matches my dna pattern resides today as i said previously it's kind of like you know a male trying to find male discovering if he is the father of a child well in a similar manner they're taking my dna and trying to find out all right so through all the people in the world in which we have a database of dna matching who does this dna strand most closely resembles to because you know that we are all unique and so what they're doing is find out who in the population of the world has a people group that resides you know resides in a specific region that is very close to matching this dna pattern and so now what we have here is uh, a screen which shows my dna sequence etc and you have the rank of the regions around the world and the number of population which matches the number of people the number of people in that region so if you look at the map there is a total of one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve i'm looking at 12 right now so 12 regions around the world in which they're discovering different you know population groups of people matching various dna strands etc all right so of the 12 regions the ones that ranks the top three where it actually narrows down to where my dna has the people but what my dna matches the a, a specific people group is what you see before you now the funny thing is is that they said that it is most of the time you will only have two ranks or two regions it says that it is not very often that you will have three regions and so the reason why that you have three regions there instead of one or two is because of what you see ranking as number one and so what is ranking as number one is african immigrants all right and so what that means is that in a population group of 12 specific identified people group having my uh, dna pattern um, they are known to be african immigrants in the in the country that they are residing in in africa or in other words the locals who are in these african countries do not recognize this people group as people of origin rather there are aliens they're foreigners they came to occupy that particular land in which the locals are sharing that land with them now and so i find this kind of weird because if i'm supposed to be of african descent right then that means that i should have a sp specific origin of people there that says that hey he is you know an african person who resided with this african people group but that's not the case so ranking at number one for african uh, for the uh, regional affiliation is African immigrants. That means that I might, the people that I am closely associated with, the people that I most likely came from are residing in countries in Africa where they are the immigrants in there. And so that makes you ask the question like, wait a minute. So if I'm an immigrant, if my people is an immigrant in the places in Africa in which they are currently residing in, then where exactly did we come from? So that's rank number one. And as you see, rank number one is almost twice the number of populations matching rank number two. It's not even a close tie. So rank number two is saying that now these are the people of origin that actually lives and were born in that territory that matches my DNA pattern. And then coming in at number, third, at number three, you have one particular population of people, a people group, in northern Africa that matches my DNA pattern and so now you have to ask the question like what is going on here why is normally you know you would have a set in stone this is where you're from your people was born and originated in this part of Africa but no according to the DNA test it's telling me that the people that I belong to are immigrants in the places in which they reside in and it's by a large number and so when you go to the diagram well the number not the number, the names of the countries down below, it gives you the top 10, uh, the top 10 rank population matches of the people who actually resides in there as to what specific region or country they reside in. And so the, the listing that you have there 
speaking specifically of Africa, you have Ang you have Angolan, I think that's how you pronounce it, right? Angolan. Then you have Gingen um, Basua, Basau, right? And then you have Wanda, and then you have Berbers, which is in Egypt. So these are the countries in Africa where the people I come from who live in that area as immigrants because the locals know that they're immigrants since they migrated to their country reside in. And so when it comes to America, right? Because remember, I told you I come from a different strand of people. Uh, I didn't come from the ones who came straight from, you know, Africa straight into America. It says that the people who close who closely matches my DNA pattern resides in New York, Alabama, and Connecticut. And so now on the next page, I made it a lot easier to show a geographical map of Africa to get a better idea as to what we're looking at. And so as we mentioned before, how for ranked number one in regional affiliation is African immigrants, where pretty much the people in which my DNA pattern matches to did not reside were not actually the original inhabitants of that particular territory, but they actually immigrated there from where we don't know. But um, as we look on the map, you see that these are the five uh, specific countries in which uh, those population group, which closely matches my DNA pattern resides in. And so the most common thing that I see here is the fact that they all reside along the coastal waters, along the coastlands. So that means that, you know, wherever they migrated to is that they strategically knew where they wanted to place themselves to have the best chance of prosperity. They stayed out of the middle um, concentration of Africa, but dispersed along the water, you know, the uh, coastal um, borders. And so what I still find interesting is about Egypt is that Egypt there in Egypt, there is one population group that was discovered, which ranks number three out of 12, which has um you know a people group there which closely matches my dna pattern and the reason why i find this interesting is that we know that in north africa it is predominantly you know inhabited by people of arabic descent and so being the fact that i am of you know african i am of black skin color the fact that there is a small remnant you know of people who closely that closely matches my dna pattern residing in egypt is pretty amazing to me um, and so this here gives more of a clarity as to where, you know, out of the many countries that is in Africa, where exactly um, the, my, the people that I closely belong to currently reside in and more than likely settled in over uh, a long period of time. And so after seeing this information, you know, this DNA information was tracked this, you know, I was really shocked by what i found because i was thinking that it might have been some common trend or that my dna marker would be scattered everywhere in africa where it would just be a general population um that would have my dna marking in which i can easily say oh well they probably came they came from sudan ethiopia chad uh, niger nigeria etc but that is not the case is that the dna marker was so precise that it actually detailed that my people group came from those you know arrows that you see right there you know those who closely resemble some my dna pattern all right so the next thing we'll take a look at is a a detailed breakdown of the population match uh which closely relates to you know my dna pattern uh from the test that they did so if you look to the left right you have your legend let me zoom in a little bit so you can see it a lot better So these are the symbols that matches different areas and different ethnicities on the map. And also you have three different colors. You have green for best match, yellow for good match, and red for pretty much weak to no match at all. And so when we go to my pattern, what you would see here is that from this legend here, it says African immigrants. So these are those who were migrated from Africa it turns out who migrated from Africa into this region uh, dating back mainly around a time of slavery we were uh, exported out of Africa into the Western nation um, and so this right here is the the predominant area where you find my genetic pattern of African immigrants and this here would be the Caribbean islands 
and over here you have even some other matches where you have green and yellow so these are your best matches and your good matches right in the western nation and you even have some markers over here down in south america uh, but when we go back to the principal focus in africa what you see here is that there is a pretty clustered population this is north africa this is where uh you will have most most of your middle eastern arabic people residing in like Libya, Egypt, etc. And so up in this northern region here, there's a pretty dense cluster of people, you know, of Africans, because remember when we go to the legend, right? It speaks about the Africans, because remember we had the African immigrants, which were exported out of Africa over here. And now for those who continue to reside there, there is a close DNA match of Africans residing in northern Africa that has my same uh, DNA match. Uh, you have one strong uh, match here which is actually in the country of Egypt and then what makes it very interesting is that you have this yellow plus sign here. So in Israel there's weak to no match at all but very close to Israel you have a good match and also this would be Saudi Arabia, Yemen area where there's a good match uh, then this would be getting to, moving towards the Syrian Iranian area over here. It's like Baghdad and Pakistan So I have a good DNA match of people uh, a population group residing in the northern part of Israel as well as southern Israel Clustered in this one particular region and then you also have strong DNA matches here for Africa for Africans uh, in the southern part of Africa South Africa and as you can see the dwelling, and this here is actually Ethiopia, Somalia region, where there's also other DNA matches close to me, uh, close to me in these regions. So it all dwells along the coastlines. Note how in the central part of Africa, there's hardly any DNA matches pertaining to me, and I'll explain to you why this is the case. Uh, so what is this plus sign here? So if these symbols right here is the Africans, right? And this here is the African immigrants from the time of slavery being exported. Then what are these plus signs? Who are these people that have a close DNA match to me? Well, when we go back to the legend, it turns out that the plus sign are Middle Easterns, or in other words, Arabs. So in this region here, I have African and Arabic ties which matches closely to my DNA. That is very interesting. And so once again, remember, green is best match, yellow is good match, and red is no match at all. This is why there's a bunch of red here for like, you know, different regions around the world, etc. So now the question is, is that what makes you know this population group these people groups so different in which there's hardly any DNA matches coming from Central Africa so the center part of Africa the Sahara Desert so I had to make a, a request back to the people who actually did my results to help me clearly identify what is the difference between African immigrants to African and also trying to I try to, to try and see where I get this Middle Eastern DNA match coming from like this is all DNA as I said before it's very accurate so pretty much in my blood in my bloodline in my blood I have African and Middle Eastern traits in me so this is Israel and these are the Middle Eastern countries right Middle Eastern where I have a close DNA match too and then also this cluster right here with this good DNA match and the reason why it is not green is because remember there is both African and Middle Eastern people that dwell there so there could have been a mixture a mixing of the two which actually weakened the DNA pattern compared to further down in South Africa where there will be less influence from the Middle East alright so this here is a email transaction that took place between me and the people that work at any lab test now in Pensacola trying to get some more clarification as to what they mean by um, African immigrant because remember on a, di on a diagram it said uh, African immigration uh, African and North um, North African 
so I wanted to get more clarification as to what they meant by um, you know the ties that I had the population ties that I had with those of uh, the African immigration branch um, and so I'm, I'm about to read to you the email transaction which took place um, and so when I actually went there as a matter of fact to get the ancestral chart that you, that you saw in the last piece um, they were not able to give me the upfront answer right away because they were not too sure since it's been a while since they performed one of these ancestral uh, hereditary testing. So what they did is that they forward the request up to their supervisor uh, to get more clarification to ensure I get the right answer. And so on the first email that you see down here it says, uh, hi blank. So now I blanked out the names of the employees because it's not important that they are mentioned here. Uh, but I did leave, you know, my information on there in case you guys want to hit me up with an email and uh, ask me some questions or have some comments, whatever. Uh, but the name of those who were part of the transaction are uh, lined out. And so it says, hi, blank. I have copied one of our customers on this result, and he has a question for you. On the report, under regional affiliation, his list, African immigration, African and North African. What is the difference in African immigra immigration versus African or North African? So that was the question that was forwarded up to the supervisor. And then I got a response back that says, I posted the question to the analyst and will let you know what I learned. Thank you. All right. Actually, this was the response from the supervisor to the one who inquired for me is that they actually took the question that I had and sent it to the analyst that specializes in DNA studies. And so when the analyst came back, this is what he explained in regards to what, it, what he meant by African immigration and how that pertains to my DNA makeup. And so this is on the 26th of April at 1529. It says, uh, I hope this exp uh, explanation helps. It says, African immigrants refers to an ethnic group of Americans, citizens or residents of the United States with total or partial ancestry from any of the black racial groups of Africa. The term may also be used to include only those individuals who are descended from enslaved Africans. So this is when, you know, the, the great migration happened, slavery happened in America and across Europe, etc. But this is where it gets very interesting about what it says about my DNA, um, uh, about my DNA in regards to the African um, immigrants. It says this group, the African immigrants, is significantly, not, not partially, not somewhat, but significantly different from North African and African roots and that, um, and that their genome is the following. is 73.2% uh, African, 24% European, uh, European, and 0.8% Native American. So in other words, the DNA makeup that is in me, uh, which has a strong connection to the African immigrants, they're saying that it is vastly different than the natives of Africa. And that in my genome, what they have discovered was the average percentage um, breakout is that I am 73.2% African, 24% European, and 0.8% Native American. And it goes on to say the genetic history of North Africa has been heavily influenced by geography. Remember when we looked back at the, uh, the chart, how they had a cluster of Africans with a good tie to me in, um, Northern African, in the North African portion? Uh, that is because of the mixture that happened that we spoke about earlier. And it says the Sahara Desert to the south and the Mediterranean Sea to the north. Uh, to the north. As a result of these geographic influences, the genetic profile of North African population is a complex mosaic admixture of European, West Asian, and Sub-Saharan African influences to variable degrees. Lastly, now this is what it speaks of the actual, you know, indigenous native Africans that uh, they're saying that we are significantly different from. It says the Sub-Saharan African groups show far less, not some, not little, but far less admixture than North African and African immigrant groups. 
So this here is saying that the indigenous native Africans, which resides in the core of Africa, uh, remember the portion that I told you that there was um, no genetic marker picked up from that center, that central region of Africa. It's saying that those people have far less mixture. There's a far less mixing, uh, mixing than that of the people of North Africa and African immigrants, which means that our genetic makeup is vastly different than the genetic makeup of the Africans that is residing there today. So once again, I mentioned to you, I said to you earlier, but that means that uh, many of us, uh, me especially, because this is the DNA traits in which it is pinked off of for this particular study, is that I am 73.2% African, 24% European, and 0.8% Native American. So the question is, where did the European and Native American piece come from? So a quarter of us is European. This is when you have to search your biblical history books. All right. So where could this European influence come from in our genome and the African immigrants genome in which it makes up our current structure, our molecular DNA structure the way it is. So the scenario that I present to you is imagine if we are the original Israelites. What point in history could there have been a mixture of African and Europeans which took place that gave us that 24% European mixture. This would be when the Greeks and the Romans occupied Israel. Where would the 0.8% Native American piece come from? This can date back to the time when the Babylonians conquered Israel and also when Israel was under the control of the Persians. And so up top it says that uh, here's the response from the analyst. So you see, this is the response of the analyst. This is not somebody who just studies some history book and they're just coming up with some random information, but a person who specializes in, in DNA study was the one who broke it out and explained this breakdown of my genome. All right, and it says, if you have any further questions, please don't hesitate to give us a call, which I'm probably going to have more questions to ask them in the future about this percentage here, because what this is showing is that when we go back to the original map, right, when we go back to this map, you, this is the concentration of the people group in which I come from. So they're saying that from this people group, there's a mixture of 72% African. 25% European and 0.8% Native American. All right, so now that we discover some um, interesting information about how uh, my DNA has been scattered to different parts of Africa, like you see, you have it down here in Yemen, you have it in Western Africa, uh, and in Egypt. We're going to go and look at some quick information about the Jews in these regions and so going to Wikipedia of course not the most reliable of sources but you know it does a decent job getting some information out it says the Jews of Balad al Sadan right it says describes the West African Jewish communities who were connected to known Jewish communities from the Middle East North Africa or Spain and Portugal Various historical records attest to their presence at one time in the Ghana, Mali, and Songhai empires. Then called the Balad as uh, Sudan from the Arabic meaning land of the blacks. Jews from Spain, Portugal, Morocco, and later years also formed communities off the coast of Senegal and on the islands of uh, Cape Verde. This place right here. <laughs> so this here is the western northern part of Africa that they're speaking about where Jews had their settlements and also in Cape Verde which is this area where there's also my DNA pattern uh, so going back it says these communities continue to exist for hundreds of years but have since this uh, disappeared due to changing social conditions persecution migration and simulation uh, going down at the bottom let me scroll down a little here it says, according to most accounts, right, to most accounts, the earliest Jewish settlements in Africa 
were in places such as Egypt, Tunisia, Morocco. Jews had settled along the upper Nile at the Elephantine in Egypt. These communities were augmented by subsequent arrivals of Jews after the destruction of the Second Temple in Jerusalem in 70 CE, where 30,000 Jewish slaves were settled throughout Carthage by the Roman Empire Titus. That is this region right here. All right, so going to a different website that adds more information about what happened to the Jews following the uh, destruction of Israel, uh, the Temple of Israel in 70 AD. It says in his book from Babylon to Timbuktu, uh, Rudolf R. Windsor gives an account of this gathering of the Israelites. It says in the year 65 BC, the Roman armies under General Pompey captured Jerusalem. In 70 AD, General uh, Vespian and his son Titus put an end to the Jewish state with great slaughter. During the period of military, of the military governors of Palestine, many outrage, yeah, outrages and all right. So it says many outrages and atrocities were committed against the residue of the people. During the period of Pompey to Julius, it has been estimated that over one million Jews fled into Africa, fleeing from Roman persecution and slavery. The slave markets were full of black Jewish slaves. Millions of Israelites were, uh, who escaped the persecution of the Roman Jewish War fled into interiors of Africa. In his book, Jewish Roots in Africa, Mr. Lich Blau, speaking of the Israelites that ran into Africa, says this. Pressed under sweeping regional conflicts, Jews settled as traders and uh, warriors in Yemen. Yemen, my DNA trait. The Horn of Africa, another DNA trait in a Somalian region from me. Egypt, once again, a pattern for me. The Kingdom of Kush and Nubia, North America, Punic Settlements, Carthage and Philippolis. Uh, uh, areas not now covered by the Marun, uh, Mary Na Nasia, I think that's how you pronounce it, Marinacia or Marinatania. More ing immigrants follow these early Jewish settlers to northern Africa. So once again, when we go back to the chart, northern Africa, there's something going on here. And so after screening through the uh, rest of the package, it speaks about, you know, the DNA basics, historical uh, migration. And I'm, you know, being blown away by the information I discovered in the first two pages, I was thinking like, what else am I going to learn? Like what other surprises that I might find in this? Now, mind you, this article, I mean, this document, you know, it's a, it's a official document. It's not some kind of Wikipedia document that you can pull out. This comes from a legit DNA company that actually specializes in understanding, you know, DNA patterns in the way how DNA dispersion was affected by migration. Um, you know, they are really in depth about what they do. And so as we continue on in the pages, it speaks about migration to the new world. Uh, things you find in the history book, like, like the uh, Neolithic uh, Revolution and Pacific Expansions. It covers in-depth in how migration occurred. It talks about the, ba the Bantu Expansions, uh, the Eurasian Expansion, uh, the Great Migrations, the Medieval and Early Modern Europe. Um, and so it continues on. And as I reach the last page, I seen something in here that completely shocked me. I mean, like, I was like, whoa, how did they manage to get that information in there? Like, is that even like, did somebody overlook this? Because if somebody would have would have actually seen this in here, wouldn't that cause some like major backlash as to why they permitted this to slip by? Um, but when it comes down to it, we all know that the DNA doesn't lie. And so when we go to the very last paragraph. You know, in the outline, it says back to Africa, humanity's forgotten migration from the Middle East and beyond. Go to the last paragraph and let's read what it says. It says beyond the generic, uh, the genetic ties, cultural ties between Africa and the near Middle East are very evident, specifically in the case of indigenous native Hebrew Jews. 
the greatest secret of Africa that has never been told and Christian Europe has been seeking to conceal for the past 2000 years is that the African origin of the concepts, doctrines, sacramental practices of religion and the documents that became the foundations of Christianity in Europe. Did you know that the names of Abraham, Isaac, Esau and Jacob were all derived from African tribal words and names? Did you know that the earliest Hebrew name for God, Adonai, was derived from an African tribal word? Did you know that other name of God, Yahweh, was derived from an African tribal God? Did you know that the names of the authors of the Old Testament are not Hebrew or Jewish names, but transposed African tribal names? Christian Europe has never known these because it has never known the uh, African linguistics and cultural side of the biblical story. When I seen this, I was completely blown away and it all makes sense now. I don't need to go into detail to even explain what this is trying to say. But what I will do is I will leave it up to you to make your own decisions because I know I have made minds. And the bottom line is, the DNA does not lie. This would be part two of my testimony of the black Israelite. Uh, so in part two, what I'm doing is I will be revisiting a previous video that I uploaded, um, which was a dream which started it all. If it was not for the Lord giving me this one particular dream for me, I would have not been led to do the DNA testing which revealed the information that was revealed in part one. And so, as I said before, when I first received this dream back in the 2nd of April 2016, well, 15, 2015, it was a very difficult one to share because I have shared previous ones before. Uh, but this one seemed very controversial to me because, you know, the whole concept of how people make a big deal about skin color when it comes to the whole Hebrew roots thing. Me personally, I couldn't care less ultimately because the most important thing is that we are all one in Jesus Christ and that everybody makes it to heaven, whether we be Jew or Gentile. Um, so in part two, it's going to give a more detailed breakdown from the, from the previous video that was released with this title as to how I had a dream and then how current events actually occurred which fulfill that dream. Blessings everyone. Uh, before I go into the dream that I received on the 2nd of April 2015, I want to open up with a word of prayer. Uh, dear Heavenly and Righteous Father, we thank you so much for this day that you have granted unto your people. And we thank you so much for the many words of insight you continue to grant unto your saints. Right now, Father, we pray for the uh, persecuted martyrs around the world who are dying, Father, because of the cross. Who are holding on to the testimony even on to death, O God. We pray that you will continue to strengthen them and hold them near you always, O God. Uh, we pray, Father, that as I begin to speak, O Lord, that you will bring back to remembrance all the things that you showed me in this dream, Father, as it pertains to a very important and significant event that shall come in the future. Uh, we love you, Father. We thank you so much once again for this moment in time. May you have your way, O God, and may the vision, may the dream that you revealed onto me hold to the accuracy and authenticity as you showed it to me, Father. We love you, Lord, and we thank you, Father, once again, and it's in your holy name we pray. Amen. All right, so on the 2nd of April, 2015, uh, the day before Passover, I had this dream. Now, I did not want to share this dream before because of the contents that was in it. It was pretty foreign to me and I thought if I were to share this of course it would stir up some controversy uh, so what I did is I held off from sharing this dream until I got greater clarification as to what exactly the Lord was trying to tell me and even now I still don't know what the Lord is trying to tell me but I do know that there is about to be a great unveiling that will take place very soon and so the dream I'm about to share you or share with you is as follows So in a dream, I was at a lake. It was a forest and to my left was this lake. It's kind of like any lake that you will come across in the States. You know, it's a nice, quiet setting, 
nothing was happening it was a the sun was shining it must have been like around the autumn season because if you are in this forest you see that the leaves are kind of brown and that there were some of these leaves on the floor but yet the sun was still shining and it was a calm cool breeze that day and then all of a sudden i heard this voice now it's one of those voices that was not coming from any particular direction but it was like coming from all directions and when you hear this voice it had like this foreign accent and in this dream what it said it said three things that already caught my attention it was very unusual the first thing that this voice said is you have taken our women and the second thing it said is you have destroyed our land and the third thing this voice said is you want to be like us and so after hearing the first portion of the dream and uh, about the voice that was uh, heard in a direction that was not identified. It was pretty much coming from everywhere. There are three distinct things in which you just heard um, this one particular voice said. And so now to connect this dream with uh, an event that happened, I want to first bring you to Wikipedia uh, where it speaks about the Charleston church shooting. And it says the Charleston church shooting, also known as the Charleston church massacre, was a mass shooting that took place at the Emanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in downtown Charleston, South Carolina, United States. Uh, it took place on the evening of June 17, 2015. It says during a prayer service, nine people were killed by a gunman, including the senior pastor. A tenth victim survived. The morning after the attack, police arrested a suspect later identified as 21-year-old Dylan Roof in Shelby, North Carolina. Now, watch how this connects to an article um, to an article that was written in CNN pertaining to the shooting and how there is a relation to this with uh, the first portion of the dream I just shared with you and so on CNN going to the portion that says before opening fire it says that Ruth spent about an hour at the historic african-american church before the massacre attending the prayer meeting uh, with his eventual victims, Charleston Police Chief Greg Mullen said. He said, uh, witnesses told investigators the gunman stood up and said he was there to shoot black people, a law enforcement official said. He answered one man's plea to stop by shooting him, said Sylvia Johnson, a cousin of the church's slain pastor, who has talked to a survivor. And now this is the portion that really caught my attention. Um, it says here, this is what the gunman said, what Dylan, uh, what the shooter said he said no you've raped our women and you are taking over the country he said according to Johnson I have to do what I have to do and so this right here has a strong relation to the first portion of the dream with the verse with the voice that I heard so remember I received that dream back in April 2015 and later on this shooting took place in June 2015 And then immediately after hearing those three voices, I was taken to this concert, right? I mean, I didn't see too many people surrounding me, but I was a spectator. And when I look ahead of me, there was a stage. And when I was looking at the stage, the curtain was closed. So after hearing those three things, I was immediately transported to this concert area. And we was waiting on something, on something to be revealed. And then as the curtains opened up, what I witnessed before me was this was like a multitude of Ethiopians who was on the stage. And the funny thing about it, though, is that they were all in hip hop gear. And it's like, you know, they're all in position getting ready to get some kind of, you know, hip hop performance, like a concert. Now, I know that this hip hop illustration doesn't really doesn't really have anything to do you know, with the whole hip hop culture itself. But based on my upbringing, I was able to see this vision and related to the fact that there's about to be a show, a presentation, something that is about to happen, which pertains to, you know, this group of people who is on stage. And while the people were on stage, one of the men who was the Ethiopians, who was part of this group, shouted with a loud voice that we're going to change the world. And then immediately after that, I was transported back to my house. And so now we go to the next uh, news headline pertaining to the second portion of our dream, where it speaks about the Ethiopian, uh, you know, the Ethiopian people who's on stage giving kind of like a performance or whatever. 
and um, how one of the guys, one of the Ethiopians shouted that we're going to change the world. And um, in a dream, he said it. He said it with a very proud and loud voice, too. Like he was very you know, proud of the fact that they were about to change the world. And so when we go to uh, CNN, right, this is a report from April 20th, 2015. And so remember that I received this dream on the 2nd of April 2015, but on April 20th, 2015, this was released. It says, ISIS executes more Christians in Libya, video shows. And when we go down here to read what they have here, it says, ISIS operatives have executed two groups of prisoners believed to be Ethiopian Christians in Libya, according to a video released Sunday by the Terror Network's media arm. It says the Ethiopian government confirmed Monday that 30 of its citizens were among the two groups, according to the Ethiopian news agency. It says the Al um, Furkan, uh, Furkan media video, which is highly produced and entitled Until There, Con Until there Came to Them Clear Evidence, shows two groups of men, one in orange jumpsuits and the other in black, being killed at different locations in Libya, according to the video's narr uh, narrator. Um, it says one group is beheaded on a beach along the Mediterranean Sea, while the other group is shot in southern Libya, hundreds of miles away. And look at this one particular thing that was said by the narrator, the ISIS member right here. He says, in fact, their blood is the purest blood because there is a nation behind them which inherits revenge. Now, what do you think that means? Which inherits revenge. There's a message right there pertaining to who these individuals are, you know, who they represent. Uh, so, yeah, this is what was so interesting about how in the dream I received that, you know, that portion of the vision concerning the Ethiopians and a group of them saying they're going to change the world and they were proud about it. And now you have um, our brothers you know, in Christ, who were martyred for the faith, and how the narrator, this ISIS member here, says that in fact their blood is the purest blood because there is a nation behind them which inherits revenge. And you know what it said. Uh, it is said that the blood of the martyrs are the seeds of the church. So could their sacrifice have planted, you know, seeds of harvest, you know, seeds of revival? for something that would take place among, you know, the community of African Americans and even Africans in general and also Middle Eastern people. Only time will tell. And while I was at my house, it was me and my wife. And my wife was waiting on a text message that was supposed to come in. Like we were both waiting on something like some blood results that was coming in. And then on her cell phone, she received a text message. She opened it up and then she tells me, she says, hey, uh, the results are in. The DNA results are in. And it is confirmed that, yeah, you are Hebrew, that you are an Israelite. And so in the dream, it's kind of like we were expecting for these results to come in. It was not like a big shocker or anything, but it seemed like I already went through some testing or something like that. And we were waiting on the results. And it turns out that my blood traced to be traced back to the Hebrews. Now, in the dream, I do not know if it was pertaining to me or if it was actually pertaining to the Ethiopian people who was on this stage on display. And so immediately after getting a sex message, it's like we already knew what to do next. And so me and my wife we got into the car and began to start driving because we were supposed to go somewhere following depending on the results. And as we were driving down this street, it was like, you know, one of those busy. If you ever been to Flatbush in New York and you ha and you remember the scene where to your left and to your and to your right with just a whole bunch of shopping stores. Well, in this dream, as we were driving down the street, instead of there being a whole bunch of shopping stores, it was all kinds of churches you know, that you can ever imagine. There's just like this big multitude of churches just to the left and to the right. And so we was driving through there and we were looking for this one specific church. All right, and so before I continue uh, in the explanation to this portion of the dream, I first wanna say that I work in a occupation field which requires me to be worldwide deployable, uh, which means that I 
can be sent at any time to go and work at any particular you know company or business for an extended period of time depending on how you know they need to utilize me and what the need is in that particular location so as for me for the last 12 years uh, I spent overseas like the only time I've ever been in the States in the last 12 years was to visit family members but for the most part my residency has been overseas doing all kinds of work you know across the globe and so this is why this portion of the dream is very interesting because when I received this dream I was actually working overseas I was not here in the States at the time when I received that dream so in the dream it already made it clear that I was in the States when this portion of it happened when I received the DNA results and stuff like that right and so I bring you now to the portion of it that speaks of the Bible Belt um, and the reason why I bring you guys here is because uh, after being deployed overseas for 12 years of my life uh, the first time coming back to stateside to where I would actually be working at for the next coming years so happened to be in the state of Florida and not any part of the state of Florida um, but in the let me scroll down right here in the northern northwestern portion of Florida where the Bible Belt Saphir is at its highest concentration right so it's just in this general area which I have returned back to to actually continue my uh, employment so when we go back to reading what the Bible Belt is for those who do not know on Wikipedia it says informally the Bible Belt is a region in the southeastern and south central United States in which socially conservative evangelical Protestant <laughs> Protestant Seism whatever plays a strong role in society and politics and Christian church attendance across the denominations is generally generally higher than the nation's average uh, the Bible Belt consists of much of the southern United States as well as parts of adjacent areas so when I was in a dream and we were in a car driving down this one particular street uh, the reason why there are so many churches you know to choose from to the left and to the right of us is because it was a sign that as when I returned back to the states um, as a dream was leading me I would be residing in one of the territories one of the states um, the areas which will be within the Bible Belt which came to pass because in, uh, in the beginning of this year 2016 I returned back to the States after being gone for 12 years overseas and the first place that I am stationed to I'm stationed at is right there in Florida in the Bible Belt concentrated area and then as we was driving through to it was at uh, it was sundown by this time pretty much the Sun was setting and so as we were driving through the streets it was getting dark and then finally we found a church we were looking for to our right hand side and so when I look at the church I looked at the sign that was before it and there were a nu there was a number and a word and the number was a number three in red placed in a white circle and to the right of this number it says the word New Jerusalem and so we're saying that okay well we found a building all right and so once we got there I got out the car and my wife said hey just call me when you're finished and I will come and pick you up and then she drove off and so when I was sitting there and I was looking at this building, if you can recall when you're driving by a fitness gym, for example, and you sometimes come across those gyms where they have that big open glass window where you can see everything that's inside. Um, and so when I was looking at this church, it was that same kind of glass window setup where you can look inside. And as I looked inside, I saw your typical church setup. You had your chairs, you had a podium, um, you had like, you know, drum sets and stuff for the praise and worship area. But the thing is, is that the lights were off. So I thought, I thought that maybe the church was closed and I needed to call my wife who would come and get me and then I would come back some other time. But then to the right of this church, of this glass window, was a door which was the entrance to the church. And as I sat there and I pulled my cell phone out and got ready to call my wife, the door opened. And the moment that I looked through this door, there was like this big, huge, not even huge, this big, bright light. It was so bright that I couldn't even really see 
what was inside at first. But I know there's a staircase that was leading up to a second floor. And, and as I look at this bright light, I saw this woman who was coming down these stairs. You know, she must have been in her 50s, a slim woman in her 50s. Now, at first when I looked at her, I thought, okay, well, she's probably, you know, the, uh, the Jew I was waiting on, the Israelite. And so when I saw her from a distance coming down the stairs, you know, she was a Caucasian woman because that's what I am accustomed to. And the thing that was really plaguing in my heart at the time was, well, what if they don't accept me? You know, because I'm, I'm a black person and it turns out that I'm Hebrew, but what if I'm rejected because of my skin color? And so as I watched this Caucasian woman who was coming back, you know, in this big, brilliant um, light setting, well, coming down the stairs, not coming back, she was coming down the stairs. As she got closer, her skin color became, was becoming more clear to me. And as she got close, what I, looked, what I saw before me was an African-American woman. You know, she was, I don't know if she was American, but she was a black woman, you know, a middle, uh, towards her 50 uh, age woman and then she was saying that ah so you made it come with us and so she begins to walk up the stairs and I followed her up the stairs now it was still bright when I was going up the stairs and I couldn't see anything uh, but this bright light but the moment that I got to the second floor I saw this big huge room it was this big is beautiful it was this huge room with circle or circular white tables you know draped with white cloth and red chairs the whole setting was the color of white and red and it was this big room and tons and tons of these tables and chairs of white and red combinations and i was looking from left to white out uh, to right and it was like this big it was kind of like you know you're having a very big fancy huge dinner party and if you look straight ahead of you towards the left you see this big beautiful podium display of white and red where i assume this is where the pastor would preach at but the place is not a typical church setting it was like this big fancy restaurant like a party or a dinner a banquet and as i was looking through i looked to my left right well i was looking at the whole scenery and beginning to my left with this was this big long line of people it was it kind of snaked around so when i looked to my left it was like people going down and uh, going straight down then it curved like looking to my left it curved to the front and a line started going right all the way all the way down and it was roped off with these red ropes this very beautiful ropes just to show where the line would guide and on the floor was this white carpet type of layout that was leading people straight down to my right. And as I stood there, the woman who was before me said, Hey, everyone, I would like to introduce you, introduce to you to another person who has found his way. And I didn't know what that meant when she said that, but she says that here's another one who has found his way. And then as I stood there, everybody stopped and looked at me and started smiling, you know, with the joyful smile, like welcome. And then afterwards, the line started moving and then she, you know, gave me this white robe and she told me and she, you know, escorted me to the position in the line. But I was thinking like, okay, why am I on this line? And now as I started my position in this line that snaked around from, a, from the left to the right, going straight down, as I began to stare straight down, as I began to look straight down to the other exit, which was way down to my right across the room, in the middle of the room, was this baptism pool. It was on the ground. And as I looked, there was a man, you know, who must have been the pastor, the shepherd of these people. And now this was a multitude of people. And the people that I saw were all African-Americans. It was interesting. Every single one of them were African-Americans. And as he was in the pool, I watched as people in their white robes would get into this baptism pool and would start being baptized in the name of Jesus. And then they would proceed on back onto the white carpet and continue on straight through this entrance to another room. And so now in this portion of the dream, I actually found a church that was patterned after what I saw when I dreamt that dream. Um, so once we came to Florida, right, we spent about a month looking for a church to go to. But it's been very challenging due to the fact that things has changed a lot in the States in the past 12 years concerning the condition of the church body uh you know i was pretty disappointed by you know what i seen the church has become and so it was really hard for me to actually find a place where me and my family can go 
and be planted there and to be and to grow in the Lord as well as help minister unto others. And so the Lord finally gave us a breakthrough, an answer through my wife where the Lord led her to a particular church on Facebook, well, on the internet, uh, that she felt led by the Lord that to tell me that this may be the place that we must go, that we may want to go to. And so the name of this church is uh, New Beginnings Anointed Christian Church. And I already find this very interesting because remember in the dream how there is a number three and in the word New Jerusalem, right? And so when I saw the word New Beginnings and being able to relate it to New Jerusalem, it already started to spark my attention a little bit. And so the thing about this flyer is that I didn't see this flyer until about until later on after that church service the only thing that i knew is that it was a place to go to and that easter sunday was approaching and that we needed to be there right because you know uh, everybody goes to church on easter even though we know resurrection day didn't actually happen on that time but there's the hebrew aspect of it but that's not the focus of today right now and what i'm putting out um so we decided hey we're gonna go and check this out because it's easter sunday why not and so when we actually entered through the church doors what immediately caught my attention was the fact that all of the members, maybe with the exception of like two, three percent of them, were all the members were dressed in white, just like in the dream. And so when I seen everyone dressed in the white, immediately I thought about that portion of the dream. And if you look on the flyer right here, it says all white Easter. And when I later on asked the pastor as to why did the church choose to wear white, he says that he told me that a week ago, you know, a week before I went to that church, he says a week ago, the Lord has put it on his heart to have the members wear white. And I was like, whoa, you know, like this, like, wow, like God would go through all that trouble, you know, and it's not even trouble for him at all, but like he was so, he was guarding over this dream, this vision that he gave me to the T. He was safeguarding it to make sure that as long as I was willing to be faithful and obey him and follow him, he was going to keep me covered and keep me on his path until I get to my destination. So in the same way where everyone was dressed like there's a, uh, a multitude of African Americans dressed in white and many having the baptism role being baptized, for me to show up in this church and see all the members dressed in white and just praising and worshiping God, I was like, wow. This must be the place where the Lord was leading me. And since I've been worshiping here, things have not been the same in my life ever since. And what gave me the final confirmation that this is the place that the Lord want me to be planted in, me and my wife and my family, uh, for the time being, at, there is, no, that is, uh, is with the model of the church, is that if you were to go to their webpage and you look at their model, it says, building for life and equipping for destiny. And this, one, and that's when I knew that this is the place that the Lord has chosen for me. And then it says, Exodus chapter 25, verse number 8 at the bottom. And so when you go to the scriptures, it says, And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. That right there, when, I mean, and when I receive this scripture in the spirit, what, uh, what pops up in my mind is one word, and that's revival. You know, revival coming to the people of God in this season. And now as I stood on the line, I was like, well, how do I tell these people that I'm, I've already been baptized and that I'm also a minister and I'm operating in the ministry? Because I guess they didn't know whether I was baptized or not. But as I sat there and I was thinking, OK, and let me wait for the opportunity to let them know, hey, I've already been baptized. I don't need to get baptized again. But when I was on this line in my white robe, before I even got a chance to see what was going to happen next, my phone actually went off and I had to wake up and go to work. Now, what's so funny about this dream is that before this dream, well, that was the end of the dream at that point. But before this dream started, I had to wake up in the middle of the night, you know, to take care of my daughter because I guess she was up very early. And when I looked at the time, it was about 4.50, 4.50, and I had to get up to go to work at 5.10. So from 4.50 in the morning, 
to 510, I had this dream. This In 30 minutes, I had like, you know, this very powerful dream. Now, I don't know what exactly this dream means. I have no idea what message does it really have, but I do know that something is about to be revealed that is about to shock the world. You know, I don't know, it's going to shock the world and it's going to change things in the way that we It'll change things forever. I don't know what God is going to do, but I know God is going to do something. And it's going to be something that is just going to change the minds of the people everywhere. It's going to shock the world. And many people are going to start coming to salvation because of this. And I think it has something to do with, with Ethiopian people. It's going to have something to do with the Ethiopian people that led to this great revival that happened amongst the African Americans in America. And so this is the message I just want to share with you guys. Now, I know that many people may be skeptical about this and stuff, but it's not my business to sit here and debate controversy. This is the dream that I received, and I knew that I had to release it eventually in the future, but I just didn't know the time for it. And this is the conclusion of the dream. Thank you for listening.